My mom's life taught me how to be loved, and her death showed me how impermanent life is. Shortly after she died, I read a book about grief and the nonlinear pain of losing someone. The author talked about how all grief stems from our attachment to people, things, memories, and places. The solution they offered was not to fool ourselves with the belief that we can hold on to anything or anyone. Well, shit, this is depressing. <laughs> I wouldn't say the morbid book was exactly comforting, but honestly, I would have become a Scientologist and sold my intestines to Tom Cruise to even be in the room with comfort after she died, so the bar was pretty low for my post-trauma reading list. <laughs> How did I interpret this deathly lesson as a 17-year-old who was about to move to San Francisco? While others were taking shots of fireball in celebration of freedom in young adulthood, I took shots to forget my own name. I withdrew so much from myself and everyone around me that it was literally impossible to attach myself to anything. I took it as a reprieve from existence because if I couldn't hold on to anything, I decided to care about nothing. And I was good at hiding it until you'd find me drunkenly stumbling the cold city streets at night with salty eyes as a pool of wasted potential. At least that's what I told myself for over a decade on my philosophical quest to understand what on earth the point of it all was. And I know your morbid curiosity is tingling, and when we're drinking beers after this, you'd want to know, how'd she die? And don't worry, you're not alone in the oddities of wanting to know how things ended. It's a protective mechanism we all have to pass along wisdom on how to avoid death. So, I'll tell you how it happened. But before I do, let's talk about Kitty, my eccentric and polarizing mother. She despised every holiday focused on her. On birthdays, she'd sit alone in her darkness and watch the world live on without her at the bottom of a self-perpetuating trench. She just wanted her marriage, family, and ultimately her depression to be fixed. She had boundless anger at my dad's affair that broke our family and it translated into a fury at a society she no longer felt a part of. How could her supposed friends not tell her that her husband was fucking someone else below deck of the boat they'd all spent countless summers on together? Now the timing of my being born was unlucky. Just after the affair and right before my dad went bankrupt, come on. At least my older sister got the delusion of a happy home and general financial stability for a few cognizant years. When my parents divorced, I grew up taking care of myself during bouts of her depression and my dad's progressive alcoholism. On bad days in elementary school, I'd set my own alarm, slip on a Disney-themed dress over a lumpy blonde ponytail, pack my Lunchable, wake my mom up from a sleeping pill slumber to take me to school, learn my multiplication, and make friends to inevitably ask for a ride home where I'd find my mom transfixed by the latest Lifetime movie about a vengeful bride out for blood against her bastard husband. <laughs> One day I came home and she was blasting Alanis Morissette's You Oughta Know. <laughs> and she belted every word like she wrote the damn song herself. And to this day, I credit my five-star karaoke performance of the song to her profound ability to hate men. And my high school boyfriends never stood a chance. <laughs> On the good days, you'd find her front row at my dance performances and talent shows, cracking jokes with fellow parents. She bought me my first thong and slingshot it across the department store <laughs> to my utter embarrassment. And she was the one who taught me how to put a tampon in. And if you know, you know. And she crowdsourced funding for my cheer competition uniform when our family went broke. The woman might have been manic, but she still got shit done. In the good years, she wrote cards telling me how proud she was, and there was no absence of love on those best days. Of course, I was no angel. Like that time in high school when I racked up a $750 phone bill for both sexting my boyfriend and expressing myself through ringback tones like Destiny's Child's Bootylicious. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't too proud of that one. So just after the sexting bill and my high school graduation, 
My mom went in for surgery on her bladder. Apparently when you get older, you start to pee when you cough. And this was a problem because believe it or not, my man-hating mother had started dating someone. So she was looking to repair some of the pipes, if you feel me. <laughs> now the surgery does not end well. Bear with me on the details. They're the only way to describe the high definition version of a tragedy. Also, this part is gonna suck. My mom's heart stopped at some point in the middle of a night in June. Everyone knew it was tragic, and her teenage daughter found her body on the living room floor. They knew Kitty was a depressed person for most of her life, and the rumors spread quickly across the suburbs. No one really cared to know it was all an accident, a mistake when the doctor prescribed her painkillers after a surgery, which didn't mix well with antidepressants. The toxicity report showed it was the chemical levels of the antidepressant that killed her. The happiness chemicals actually killed her. I obsessed over every small detail of the hours leading up to her death. Almost like if I remembered everything, she somehow wouldn't be gone. Before she went to bed that night, she made egg salad for the two of us. It's the best egg salad she's ever, I've ever made, she told me. I went to bed early and I slept in her bed because she was out on the couch in the living room. The living room I cleaned for years as a self-made list of chores. It was easier for her to go to the kitchen or to use the bathroom out there in the living room after her surgery. The surgery she got to fix her bladder because she only wanted to be fixed. Before she went in for the procedure, she gave me her chapstick. I love you very much, Maddie, she told me. And then she gave me her chapstick. It's in the details. While she was healing, I invited my boyfriend over. I made Eggos that morning, sweet, syrupy waffles from a box, and he hugged her at the end of her visit and said, get well soon, Kitty. The morning she was gone, I watched television in her bed for an hour before I got up. I watched television before I found her. Before I found her, I was in her bed. The moment I walked into the living room, I saw her there on the ground, peacefully still. She wanted to be fixed. I ran to the bedroom to call 911. Hello, please explain your emergency. The memory is gone, the one where I explain. I felt the person on the other end of the line was too calm for what I'd just seen. We have an ambulance dispatch, they'll be there in 10 minutes. I waited outside in my underwear, heart out of my chest, and my cries woke the neighbor. She walked over to me in her pink frilly nightgown and sat down. Hey there, sweetie, is everything okay? I sat on the asphalt, knees bent to my chest with a t-shirt wrapped over them, and I rocked back and forth. My mom's in there, she's not moving. Oh dear, did you call someone? There was pressure in my chest and I was suffocated by her presence. Is your mom a woman of God? She asked. She goes to church. That's great, sweetie. She's with God now. And she sat down next to me and looked for my hand, but I didn't offer it. God wasn't exactly on my best friend list at the moment, and I hated her for trying to console me by making it about her own beliefs. But the truth is, none of us know the right thing to say in these types of moments. My mom's new boyfriend gave me a card and $150 with his condolences. Huh? Some words of wisdom. Don't be sorry for my loss. It's actually more of a get well soon and or in the next 10 to 20 years hallmark moment. Now the ambulance pulled up to my driveway of 2382 Primrose Avenue and my heart started on a new rhythm without her. If time reset in a universe where she was alive in my rhythm, I'd spend my mornings opening up the blinds and showing her the world from my eyes. I imagine taking her hand and walking down by the ocean to discuss big ideas. She'd urge me to move closer to San Diego and I'd consider it because of her. We'd stay up late watching movies and laughing at the silly plot twists of life, marriage, and family and she'd encourage me to stay true to my beliefs and to write as much as I could. 
We'd argue about her wanting me to have children and my not being ready just yet. And I'd grow concerned for her age as her weathered skin began to betray her with signs of aging. It's in the details. When a person is depressed, we expect them to stop acting like it. We project our brains onto them, fix it. But I don't think support is stitched. It's listening even when we know they're wrong and showing up when life doesn't really feel convenient. It's knowing the best of them after seeing the worst and waking up in the morning after a long fight to stay for tea just because. I look back at where I came from and I can't help but obsess over time. I read anything I can get my hands on that could give some amount of meaning to the timeline I landed in. I dove into the philosophical deep end of quantum exploration because my hope in the unknown universe among universes was the only key to a vastness of grief I could not comprehend. Every day I watch the clouds moving, air above water, and there's nothing to be made of nothing. Only matter, which surrounds invisibility, can show me what nothing is made of. Space and time frozen in a capsule of her absence. I contain it for a while in a balloon, drifting as a moment playing in time. A little bit of heaven navigating back to where I came from, until the constricted matter loses its hold on an element built for space. When matter loosens her grip on the oxygen inside my skin, I float up in a way to be the whole, only to be captured again by space. Bubbles in time as I continue to gulp air towards my end. Now that I've traveled to the darkest depths of what a human can endure, when I look back at the stumbling drunk teenager wandering the streets of San Francisco, I no longer see myself as a broken person who wasted her potential with an unlucky hand. No. I respect the hell out of that girl for what she went through to get to the other side. And I see the rawness in her grief. I see the warrior who landed in a battle without a shield and kicked ass anyway. My mom named me after the mermaid in Splash. <laughs> and she hoped I'd become famous one day. She encouraged me to write to Oprah and tell the story of us. Mostly to humiliate my dad the way she was humiliated by him, I think. And it's been 14 years since she died. And I know you all are not Oprah, but I think she'd be proud of me anyway. I no longer think the answer to the pain of grief lies in quantum physics, Alanis Morissette, going numb, or in the frilly nightgown promises of God. If you didn't get it by now, I'll say it again. It's in the details. Give it up for Vamp, first timer, Madison the Mermaid Ford! <laughs> <laughs>